Just look around and see what is going on everywhere here. Glance around merely at these rooms of the Grand Café, where, besides the ordinary professional prostitutes and gigolos who are constantly here, hundreds of men and women are always sitting at the little tables gaily conversing. Looking at these men and women now, you would say they were married couples who have come here together, either to see Paris or on some family business. But as a matter of fact, it is practically certain that in all the halls of this Grand Café, there is not a single couple among these men and women so gaily chatting and about to go to some hotel together, who are legal man and wife even though at the same time every one of them may be on paper a legal husband or wife. The other legal halves of the men and women sitting here who have remained at home in the provinces are probably thinking now and telling their acquaintances positively that their legal wife or legal husband has gone to the world capital Paris to make some very important purchases for the family or to meet somebody there very important for the family, or something else of the same sort. But in reality, in order to get here, these birds of passage have had to intrigue for a whole year and cook up every kind of story to convince their legal halves of the necessity of their trip. And now here, in the company of deceivers and intriguers like themselves, in the name of and to the glory of the significance of the epithalamium aided by the fine art which this great contemporary civilization has attained, they decorate their stay-at-home legal halves with the largest possible fine art horns. In Europe, thanks to the established order of family life, it has now already come about that if you meet a man and a woman together and notice that while conversing, gay tones are heard in their voices and smiles appear on their faces, you can then be quite sure that very soon, if they have not already done so, they will have effectively and without fail put on some legal half a pair of the largest and most beautiful horns. Hence it is that any one slightly cunning man here may already be accounted a very honorable man and the patriarchal father of a family. To those around him, it is of no concern that this honorable and patriarchal father of a family has perhaps at the same time, if of course his means permit, as many mistresses as he pleases on the side. On the contrary, those around him here usually show even more respect for such a man than for one who is unable to have any mistresses at all. Here, these honorable husbands who have the means not only have on the side, in addition to their one legal wife, seven, but sometimes even seven times seven illegal wives. And those European husbands who have not the means of supporting several illegal wives in addition to their one legal wife spend almost the whole of their time in what is called drooling. That is to say, for days on end they stare at and, as it were, devour with their eyes every woman they meet. In other words, in their thoughts or in their feelings, they betray their one legal wife an innumerable number of times. But although among us in Persia a man can have as many as seven legal wives, Yet, nevertheless, all his thoughts and feelings are occupied day and night how he can best arrange both the inner and the outer life of these legal wives of his. And the latter, in their turn, are absorbed in him and try their utmost also day and night to aid him in his life duties. Here, the reciprocal inner relationship between husband and wife is the same just as almost all the inner life of the husband is spent in being unfaithful to his one legal wife, so also the inner life of his one wife from the first day of their union is always straying outside the family. 
For a European wife, as a rule, as soon as she is married, her husband becomes for her inner life, as they say, her own property. After the first night, being then secure in her ownership, she begins to devote the whole of her inner life to the pursuit of a certain something, that is, to the pursuit of that indefinable ideal, which from early childhood is gradually formed in every European girl thanks to that famous education, which is ever more and more always being invented for them by various contemporary conscientiousless writers. During my stay in these European countries, I have observed that there is never formed in the being of a woman here that something which should, in her as in our women, constantly maintain what is called organic shame, or at least the disposition to it, upon which feeling, in my opinion, what is called wifely duty is based, and which is just what instinctively aids her to refrain from those actions which make a woman immoral. That is why every woman here can very easily at any favorable opportunity without either suffering or remorse of conscience betray her legal husband. It is in my opinion, owing to the absence of this shame in them, that here in Europe the line dividing the woman mother from the woman prostitute has gradually ceased to exist and that these two categories of women have already long ago been merged into one, so that, at the present time, there is neither in the mind nor in the feelings of the men here that division of women into two categories which almost every Persian makes. Here, one can now distinguish the women mother from the woman female, only if one sees all her manifestations with one's own eyes. In the European conditions of family life, owing to the absence of the beneficent institution of polygamy, an institution which in my opinion should long ago have been introduced here, if only for the simple reason that, as statistics show, the women here far outnumber the men. There are thousands of other discomforts and improprieties which need not exist at all. And so, respected doctor, the fundamental cause of my second vice was that, being born and brought up in traditions of morality entirely opposed to those here, I came here at an age when the animal passions in a man are especially strong. The ensuing evils for me personally arose chiefly from the fact that I came here while still very young, and according to the notions here, handsome, and owing to my genuine southern type, a great many women here, for whom I represented a new and original type of male, began a regular hunt for me. They hunted me like big game. And I was big game for them not only on account of my specific type, a genuine southerner, but also on account of my gentleness and courtesy towards women, properties which had been instilled in me from my earliest childhood in my associations with our Persian women mothers. When I came here and began meeting the women here, I was, of course, even unconsciously on my part, gentle and courteous towards them also. And so, meeting with the women here, and at first only talking with them, chiefly on the subject of con 